Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the second day of global climate change, generic infectious diseases, co-joint webinar hosted by Korean Academy of Science and Technology and ASA. As you learned already, we had a very excellent session yesterday about climate change and its impact on ecosystem, environment, and the possible influence to genetic infectious diseases. This morning, we are focusing more about genetic infectious diseases. We have four excellent speakers this morning from Hong Kong, Japan, and the International Vaccine Institute and in Korea. I'd like to invite first speaker from University of Hong Kong, Professor Patrick Wu. He is going to talk about coronavirus discovery and phylogeny and uh, jumping, interspecies jumping uh, the activities. Uh, so please join us. Welcome Professor Wu for his presentation. Professor Wu, stage is yours. Okay, all yours, Professor Wu, you can start. <clears throat> so, good morning, everybody. Um, first of all, thank you very much for inviting me to speak in your symposium. So in the next uh, 40 minutes, what I would like to do is to take you through a journey to visit some of the coronaviruses that we have discovered in the last um, 15 to 20 years. So everything began because of SARS. Before the SARS epidemic, the coronavirus field was a very, very quiet field of research. Very, very few people were interested in coronavirus research. But then SARS woke everybody up. After the SARS epidemic in 2003, everybody suddenly woke up. So from then on, many people started to look at what other coronaviruses we have in humans and animals. And that has led to a lot of new coronaviruses being discovered, new genomes being sequenced. And we have improved our understanding on the phylogenetics of coronaviruses a lot uh, after 2003. So before we start the journey to visit the various coronaviruses that we have discovered, I would like to use two slides to serve as an introduction so as to make sure that we are speaking in the same language. So this is how viruses are classified. So viruses are classified depending on what sort of genetic materials the virus contains. So they are classified into DNA viruses and RNA viruses, and then in turn into double-stranded, single-stranded DNA viruses and double-stranded and single-stranded RNA viruses. So you can see that coronaviruses are here. Coronaviruses are single-stranded RNA viruses. They are plus-strand, single-stranded RNA viruses. So how about classification of coronaviruses themselves? Now, this is how coronaviruses were classified before the SARS epidemic in 2003. This was the situation before 2003. Now, you can see that this is the electron micrograph of coronaviruses, and this is a schematic representation of the coronavirus. Now, before 2003, we have three genera of coronaviruses. 
alpha coronavirus, beta coronavirus, and gamma coronaviruses. Now, the genome size of coronavirus is around 30 kilobases, 30 kilobases. Around two thirds of the genome was occupied by this open reading frame 1AB. Open reading frame 1AB and codes a long polypeptide, which was in turn cleaved into 15 to 16 short proteins. And within this ORN, ORF1AB, we have the RNA dependent RNA polymerase, the PO gene. All right, downstream to that, we have the S gene, E, M, and N. So this is the spike envelope membrane and nucleocapsid. The spike gene encodes the spike protein, which is situated, located on the surface of the coronavirus. E and M is over here. And then the nucleocapsid protein is within the coronavirus, <clears throat> closely associated with the single-stranded RNA. So this is the phylogenetic tree constructed using the genomes that were available, the coronavirus genomes that were available before the SARS epidemic. So as you can see, there were just around 10 genomes available. This was the first coronavirus discovered. It was discovered in 1930s, infectious bronchitis virus, which is a coronavirus present in pouches, chickens, birds. All right. And then in the 1940s, people discovered this murine hepatitis virus from mouse. And in the 1960s, people discovered these two human coronaviruses, human coronavirus 229E and human coronavirus OC43. And before the SARS epidemic, actually, these two coronaviruses were the only known human coronaviruses. And so you can see that uh, by phylogenetic classification, these coronaviruses were classified into alpha coronavirus, beta, and gamma. Alpha and beta coronaviruses were present in mammals. All these were in mammals. The only coronavirus present in birds was this one, infectious bronchitis virus. Okay, so that was the situation before the SARS epidemic. So with that background, let us go to visit the various coronaviruses that we discovered in the last 20 years. So the first one is a human coronavirus, human coronavirus HKU1. <clears throat> now, we went back to 2004. That was the time right after the SARS epidemic. So what we, at that time, we saw a patient who visited our hospital in Hong Kong. That was a 71 year old male patient who presented with fever, cough, sputum, and chest X-ray show some infiltrates. So basically this patient has pneumonia and we carried out the standard investigation for a patient with pneumonia. We collected nasal pharyngeal aspirate to look for respiratory viruses, viral culture, to RT-PCR, SARS coronavirus, and so on and so forth. All these were negative. We collected sputum for bacterial and mycobacterial culture, negative pear serum for mycoplasma clay media, and so on and so forth. They, are all, they were all negative. The patient recovered well and was discharged on day five. But because all these were negative, so at that time, <clears throat> we wonder there was a novel pathogen in this patient. <clears throat> And because we have been working on SARS coronavirus for quite a while, we wonder whether this patient has a novel coronavirus. So what we did was we used the patient's nasal pharyngeal aspirate and we performed RT-PCR of pogene of coronaviruses. So we extracted RNA from the patient's NPA and we used a pair of conserved primers for coronaviruses, which amplified a 440 base pair fragment of coronavirus. And then the result was positive and we sequenced it. And we were very excited before because we found a branch here, which probably represented a novel coronaviruses. So you can see that at that time, we have already have this SARS coronavirus. At that time, another human coronavirus named human coronavirus NL63 has already been discovered. 
in um, 2004. NL stands for Netherlands. So this was this chart, this discovered by a Dutch group. So, and then we discovered this new coronavirus, which we subsequently named it as human coronavirus HKU1. Now then we sequence the complete genome of human coronavirus HKU1 and compare the genome of this novel coronavirus with other known coronaviruses. So this is human coronavirus HKU1. So you can see that it looks, the genome organization looks like that of beta coronavirus, DNH A. Now, before we, as you know, before that, um, we have alpha, beta, gamma. There was just one beta. But then after the, discover, the discovery of SARS coronavirus, there's already a branch here. SARS coronavirus branch out from the other beta coronavirus. <clears throat> and SARS coronavirus is called beta coronavirus lineage. B. Now, what we have it in human coronavirus HKU1 is that it looks like beta coronavirus lineage A, and also in the phylo phylogenetic tree, it is also lineage A. <clears throat> so it has two papain-like proteases, and it has this hemagglutinin as this gene, just like beta lineage A. Now, after we have published this study, many people all over the world started to look for human coronavirus HKU1 in their own countries. So here are just some of the earlier studies on human coronavirus HKU1. So you can see that uh, everywhere in the world, they have all these four human coronaviruses, OC43, HKU1, 229E, and NL63. So we, we, what we can conclude with human HKU1, uh, human coronavirus HKU1 is that it is a global coronavirus. So it is found everywhere in the world. It more prevalent in winter. It is a human coronavirus in that the reservoir is human, is only found in human, not found in any other animals. The incidence is around one to 5%. So that was human coronavirus HKU1. So now <clears throat> let's turn to another um, uh, coronavirus, bad SARS coronavirus HKU3. Now, when SARS occurred, people found SARS coronavirus in this animal, civet cats. But then very uh, sh shortly afterwards, people know that civet cats were only the intermediate host for, corona for SARS coronavirus, but not the ultimate reservoir of um, SARS coronavirus. So because of that, we try to look for new coronaviruses and see whether we can find the ultimate reservoir for SARS coronavirus in 2003. So what we did was we performed a surveillance study in Hong Kong. We collected uh, more than 400 nasal pharyngeal and anal swabs from different kinds of animals in Hong Kong from 11 different locations during a one year period. So these stars were where we went to collect the samples. So we went to the, um, the these, these pictures were taken during our trips to collect bat, fecal and nasal samples. So we went to these um, forest in Hong Kong. We went into these water tunnels and caves because we, we know that Beds were present in these water tunnels and caves. So this is a bed expert that we collaborated with in Hong Kong. So what we used to collect the beds were these uh, long poles with a net. So we went into the water tunnels. So we could what we could see were the beds hanging on the roofs, ro roosting uh, in these water tunnel and caves. So we used a long pole to tip the bed so that the bed will fall into the net and then the bed fall into the net. This is another equipment that we used to collect the, uh, to capture the beds, which is called the mist net. So these are two poles and actually there is a net here, but you can't see the net. So when the bed flies through the net, it will be captured. And that is another way of capturing the bed. So after we captured the bat, what we did was we measured the arm span and look at the morphology of the bat so that we 
we know what bad it is. And then another important thing is we try to take the nasal pharyngeal swab and also the anal swab of the bat. So you can see that we use this swab to take the nasal pharyngeal and the anal swab and put and then put the swab in this virus transport medium, take it back to a laboratory. And we've used the same pair of conserved primers that we use for amplifying human coronavirus HGU1 to look for the presence of coronaviruses in bats. And the results were positive and we sequenced the uh, positive bands and we found that there were actually three novel coronaviruses in these bats. So we were very excited because we saw this particular uh, sequence in the phylogenetic tree because it this very, very closely relates to the SARS coronavirus found in zebra and human. So what we believe that we probably might have found the reservoir of um, SARS coronavirus in bats. So this is the result of the surveillance study, bats, rodents, and monkeys. The only positive result was in this type of bat, named Chinese horseshoe bat, Rhinolophus sinicus. So this is the horseshoe bats. It's its name as horseshoe bats is because of the shape of the nose. So you can see that the shape of the nose looks like horseshoe. And that is the reason why it is called <clears throat> horseshoe bats. And this sort of bat will like to gather together roosts inside caves, you know, on the ceiling of caves. And this actually facilitated a lot of um, inter bat transmission of the virus. And this is the, um, reservoir of SARS coronavirus. So you can see that um, this is the PO gene, this is the S gene, and they are close. This coronavirus is closely related to SARS coronavirus. So now that was a bad SARS coronavirus. Let's take a look at some other bad coronaviruses. Now. <clears throat> We go back to this phylogenetic tree. Remember, in addition to this particular bad SARS coronavirus, there were actually other novel coronaviruses found in bats. Because of that, we thought that there are probably more coronaviruses in bat. So we performed uh, even bigger surveillance studies concentrating in bats in Hong Kong, in different kinds of bats in Hong Kong. We took more than 600 samples from more than 300 bats of 13 species in 20 locations in Hong Kong, using the same pair of primers, try to amplify coronaviruses and then sequence all the positive fragments. What we found were many, many novel coronaviruses in bats, in different kinds of bats. And then we named these coronaviruses as bad coronavirus HKU2, HKU4, HKU5, HKU6, HKU7, and HKU8. Now, what is most interesting is the phylogenetic studies. So you can see that that is alpha. So some these uh, red and blue ones are the new coronaviruses in bats. So you can see that there are some novel alpha bad coronaviruses beta coronaviruses. Now that is lineage A, that is lineage B with the bad SARS coronavirus. What is most interesting is that we have found two coronaviruses that were distinct from all the other beta coronaviruses. And these coronaviruses were classified as beta coronavirus lineage C. And these were bad coronavirus HQU4 and bad coronavirus HQU5. At that time, we didn't um, know the significance of these clinical significance of these coronaviruses, but these became suddenly very important when MERS coronavirus emerged in the Middle East. So, you know, MERS emerged in 2012. So when, MERS, when people sequenced the genome of MERS coronavirus, they suddenly appreciated that MERS coronavirus were very closely linked to HKU4 and HKU5. So that is lineage C 
beta coronavirus. And that makes these two coronaviruses that we have discovered in bed very important because um, they have facilitated research in MERS a lot. And these were believed to be the reservoir for MERS coronavirus or the ancestor of MERS coronavirus. So then we performed further studies to see whether they are really the ancestor of um, MERS coronavirus. And we found that the S protein of bad coronavirus HKU4 actually can also bind the human, human DPV4 receptor for MERS coronavirus. And then very recently, last year, we published this paper in Nature Communications, which we described the isolation of um, human or of uh, this uh, bad coronavirus HKU4. And we also showed in a human DPPP4 transgenic mouse model that this coronavirus can actually use DPV4 and infects human DPV4 transgenic mice. Now, after we have performed this uh, bad coronavirus uh, surveillance studies in Hong Kong, we went back to Guangzhou in China to see whether we can find more coronaviruses in bats. So what we can, uh, we used the same pair of primers, we collected more bat samples from different kinds of bats. And we found, of course, we can find coronaviruses that we have already found in Hong Kong, like HKU8, HKU2, and so on. But in addition, we also found two new, new coronaviruses in these Guangzhou bat samples. And we subsequently named them as bat coronavirus HKU9, and bad coronavirus HQ10. So what is most interesting again is the phylogenetic tree classification. So we have alpha, we have uh, beta coronavirus lineage A, lineage B, lineage C, so HQ4 and 5. And you can see that HKU9 actually constituted again another distinct branch in the beta coronavirus, which we subsequently name it or classify as beta coronavirus lineage D. <clears throat> now, so that was um, beta coronavirus, uh, that was bad coronaviruses. Now, so far we have gone through the human coronavirus, actually one bad SARS coronavirus and a whole bunch of bad coronaviruses, which <clears throat> give rise to a few li new lineage within the beta coronavirus. So our next question was whether there are more bird coronaviruses in a while that we have missed in the past. Because you know, in birds, there was only one, one known coronavirus, which is the infectious bronchitis virus, the first coronavirus discovered, no other bird coronaviruses. Because of that, so we carried out a surveillance studies in birds in Hong Kong. So the study was on more than 1,500 dead wild birds in more than 70 different species in 32 families of birds in Hong Kong. And we use, again, we use the same pair of primers. We amplify the 440 base pair fragment. We sequence the positive bands. And in this study, we found three new coronaviruses called what we called Mooney coronavirus, Bubu coronavirus and thrush coronavirus. So again, what is most interesting is the phylogenetic tree classification. Now, this is alpha coronavirus, beta coronavirus, gamma coronavirus. What is most interesting is, is that you can see that these three bird coronaviruses were distinct from all the other alpha, beta, and gamma coronavirus. This avian coronavirus is actually the infectious bronchitis virus that were found in birds, the only coronavirus found in birds. And we now have a new group of coronavirus, which was subsequently named as Delta coronavirus. So we have found a new genus of coronavirus. And these coronaviruses that were underlined in red were the coronaviruses that were discovered during or after the SARS epidemic. 
So you can see that there are many, many, many new coronaviruses discovered after the SARS epidemic. And within this gamma coronavirus, actually people have found another coronavirus in mammals. Not, so it's not only in birds, but also in mammals, in whales. And we will come back to that later. And we can also perform these comparative uh, genomic studies and so that you can, you can see that coronaviruses that are closely linked together tend to have um, similar uh, genome structures, like you have two papain-like proteases for alpha and beta coronavirus of group A. For beta coronavirus of group A, you have this hemagglutinin asterisk gene and so on and so forth. <clears throat> So after we have discovered the Gelder coronaviruses in those birds, we knew that we have found a new genus of coronavirus. So we want to have a more extensive study to see whether there are actually more Delta coronaviruses, both in birds and whether these Delta coronaviruses may also be present in mammals. So in this study, we collected samples from more, more than 3,000 mammals and more than 3,000 birds in Hong Kong, same pair of primers. And we found that there are actually many, many Delta coronaviruses in different kinds of birds. So we named them as white eye coronavirus, HKU16, sparrow, HKU17, magpie robin, HKU18, night heron, HKU19, Wijian, HKU20, and Kaman Muran, HKU21. But in addition to the bird Delta coronaviruses, what is most interesting is that we found a Delta coronavirus in mammal, also in pigs. So that makes it very interesting because Delta coronaviruses are not only present in birds, but it can also be present in mammals. So this is the phylogenetic tree um, analysis of these um, coronaviruses. So that you, you can see that actually some are very closely linked to each other, like this sparrow coronavirus, HU17, is actually closely related to the porcine coronavirus HKU15. So meaning that this um, pig coronavirus may have jumped from the sparrow coronavirus some time ago and so on and so forth. So because of that, we then constructed this model of coronavirus evolution. So what we, depicted was that we have the coronavirus ancestor many, many, many years in the past, which might have infected either a bat or bird. So that giving rise to the bat lineages and the bird lineages. For the bat lineages, it will further uh, divide into uh, the alpha coronavirus and the various groups of beta coronaviruses. And then the coronavirus jumps to other animals, other mammals, including human beings, dogs, cats, mouse, and so on and so forth. So for the bird coronaviruses, they also jump from one bird to another. But in addition, they may also jump to some mammals like the whale or gamma, and also the pig in, for Delta coronavirus. So what we have now is this one, this phylogenetic tree, but now, so you can see that in this particular group, the gamma coronavirus, as I have mentioned before, in addition to the um, infectious bronchitis virus, there is another gamma coronavirus in whale. Because of that, we are very, very, very interested in that. So we want, the question that we asked at this time was whether there are more gamma coronavirus in mammals, in particular, these sea mammals, whales. And because we are in Hong Kong, we went to the ocean park to look for collaborations because they are sea mammals in the ocean park. So we call it, for this particular study, we collected samples from three different kinds of um, sea mammals, sea lions, seals, and dolphins. Same pair of primers. <coughs> and we found in this study, we found a new coronavirus 
which we named as bottle nose dovin coronavirus HKU12. So you can see that it is here, phylogenetic tree classification. It is closely related to the beluga whale coronavirus here. It is a gamma coronavirus. So gamma coronavirus, so the um, dolphin coronavirus here, closely related to the beluga whale coronavirus. Actually, this coronavirus has the largest genome size for all the coronaviruses known so far. And because it is a study carried in ocean parks, they have serial, serial serum samples and serial um, <clears throat> fecal samples collected and archived for their animals. So we can see that um, there's actually zero conversion, zero conversion for the three um, dovins that we have detected coronaviruses in. So in this model of coronavirus classification, we can now add a new member here. So now we turn to camel coronavirus because you know in 2012, there was the outbreak of MERS coronavirus and you know that MERS coronavirus was present in dormitory, dormitory camels in the Middle East. Because of that, we ask the question whether <clears throat> there are any other coronaviruses present in mammals. So we look for collaborators in the Middle East. And this time I went to Dubai to look for collaborator. So I went to this veterinary laboratory in Dubai, the um, Central Veterinary Research Laboratory in Dubai. So, I, uh, so you can see that this is the lobby of the laboratory in Dubai, showing camel raising, showing falcons, etc. So I gave a talk and then I collaborated with these um, researchers in Dubai. So this is the uh, laboratory which they used to um, perform autopsies, necropsies on camels. So you can see that they do perform necropsies in camels. But what I, most, what I was most interested in were these the fecal samples of camels. So I collected these fecal samples, put them in virus transport medium, and then <clears throat> perform um, RT-PCR using the pair of uh, conserved primers on coronaviruses. So for these camel samples, we found that 4.8% were positive for coronavirus. And after sequencing, we found that it, we found a new coronavirus, what we call dromedary camel coronavirus XKU23, which is a beta coronavirus lineage A over here. And we also performed zero prevalence studies and found that 52%, around half of the camels were actually positive for antibody against this coronavirus. <clears throat> So we can now add the camel to this uh, model of coronavirus evolution. So lastly, the study that we performed for these um, Middle East animals were, um, were, were, were whether there are any other Delta coronaviruses in the Middle East. Now, in the Middle East, uh, the two animals that they liked most, that they valued most are one, camels, and two are the falcons. So because of that, we collected falcon samples. And in addition to that, we also collected other bird samples, fecal samples from various birds in the Middle East. And we used the pair of primers to try to look for novel coronaviruses. And we started positive and we sequenced all the positive bands and we sequenced the genome. And we found that there were four new coronaviruses in birds in the Middle East, which we named them as Falcon Coronavirus 27, Hobura HQ28, Big Gen 29, and Quayo Coronavirus HKU30. So again, this is the phylogenetic tree classifications, and they were you can see that they were clustered with the other Delta coronaviruses that we discovered previously, so HKU 27, 28, 29, and 30. And some were quite um, closely related to each other. So that were the 
spread coronaviruses. And we also perform um, zero prevalence studies for the falcon coronavirus XJU27 in their falcons. And we found that actually 75% of their falcons were zero positive for this particular falcon coronavirus. So they love these falcons very much. They use them uh, to help them to hunt animals in the past and they, uh, and they, and they use that as a hobby nowadays. So falcons shown in many, many, many um, situations in, in television shows in the Middle East. So with that, uh, that's all I would like to share with you uh, in this talk. So I would like to, lastly, I would like to thank my collaborators, uh, my co-investigators, the clinicians that we have worked with, with in Hong Kong because they helped us a lot in collecting the human samples and also the um, uh, clinical histories of the patients. Uh, our government, uh, because they helped us to collect various animal samples, bats, birds, and so on and so forth. Our friends in Ocean Park, our collaborators in Guangzhou, my collaborators in Dubai, and of course, lastly, our PhD students, because they were the people who have really done a lot of hard work. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Professor Wu, for your wonderful presentation. Uh, before we move on to the second speaker, I have uh, one very quick question to you. Uh, we in Korea, we are very concerned about that the migrate bird uh, infects uh, the uh, domestic birds uh, to carrying the avian influenza virus. And also we are concerned about African swine fever through the, the wild pig. So do you think any possibility to look at the coronavirus from migrate bird from Siberia or uh, Baikal Lake and also that uh, wild uh, uh, pig from North Korea? Certainly, because um, in, you know, in one, for one Delta, one Delta coronavirus, it does not only infect birds, but we can also find Delta coronavirus in pigs. That means um, inter interspecies transmission from birds to pigs is definitely possible. But what is a little bit different from influenza is that for coronaviruses, they are pretty uh, species specific in the sense that one coronavirus usually will infect only one species of birds. They do not jump from one species of birds to another species that easily. So it is that in that in that uh, sense, it is a bit different from influenza virus. But what you said is perfectly correct. It is um, definitely possible because we have found Delta coronavirus in both birds and pigs. So yes, it, I think it is uh, really a worthwhile study to carry out. Thank you very much, Professor Wu. Okay, we may discuss further at the panel discussion after that. Okay, now we move to the second speaker, Professor Kuei Makita from the Lakuno Gakuen University, Japan. He's going to present on the ecosystem analysis of human dog wildlife rabbits in South Africa. Please join us to welcome uh, Professor, uh, uh, Professor Makita. Okay, good morning. Uh, so, good morning. Uh, yes, so thank you very much for invitation uh, to this wonderful uh, conference. So I'm going to talk about the ecosystem analysis of human dog wildlife rabies uh, in South Africa. Uh, first of all, uh, maybe many of you might heard, but maybe not, uh, zero by 30 here. 
zero means zero deaths of human by 30, is it by 2030. So globally, uh, lots of uh, international organizations uh, are trying to achieve the zero deaths of humans by 2013 due to rabies. Uh, but the current situation uh, is uh, annually. Uh, it is said that 59,000 people die every year. And 40% of them are children in Asia and Africa. This zero by 30 uh, has three objectives. One is to efficiently prevent and respond. Uh, the second, to generate, innovate, and measure impact. And the third is to sustain commitment and resources. So rabies virus uh, is a Lisa virus. Uh, I showed uh, the lineage of Lisa viruses here. Uh, there are three uh, major uh, groups and the rabies constitutes uh, one of the, the groups. The rabies virus is a neurotropic virus that propagates in the central nervous system of the infected host. And the virus, uh, after the invasion, uh, it progresses uh, through the uh, neurocyte, uh, uh, keeping that system. So or even if a rabid dog uh, bites at the the legs, your legs, then the, vi the virus uh, goes through uh, transmitting, transmitting through uh, the nervous system into the uh, brain. Then case fatality rate in humans is almost 100%. And over 90, 90% of human rabies are infected by rabid domestic dogs. That this map uh, shows global distribution of basically human deaths uh, due to rabies. Uh, the brown area uh, shows the area with endemic human rabies, which means, uh, of course, there are uh, endemic dog rabies cases. And the second uh, group is a little bit red place. Uh, is endemic uh, in dog rabies, but uh, not so much human rabies cases, it's sporadic. And uh, those other green parts, including uh, Korea and Japan, uh, do not have dog rabies cases. So uh, we have seen that there are still uh, lots of human deaths uh, due to rabies, but there are al already very effective vaccines uh, in humans and dogs as well. So why there are still many rabies victims in the presence of effective post-exposure prophylaxis, PEP. So PEP uh, is uh, the people vaccinate after bitten by rabid, rabid dog. Then uh, there are cause of, of several uh, vaccinations uh, into humans. Then the before or rabies virus reaches to brain, as this PEP can prevent the progress of uh, rabies virus invasion into brain. And it is very effective. So if people use PEP even after bitten by a rabies dog, the most likely the death can be avoided. However, uh, you have seen lots of um, very wide range of global distribution of human deaths due to rabies. Uh, the reason why this happens uh, is one, lack of income, transportation and treatment costs. So people are too poor uh, to have those uh, preventive measures. And the second, poor knowledge on rabies. People don't know much about the danger of rabies even in the uh, endemic countries. And attitude towards animal bites, uh, people may neglect, it, neglect the importance of PEP and rabies. 
So because of these uh, uh, reasons, uh, victims uh, frequently do not seek medical care in a hospital. Then the deaths uh, occur. So I talked about the human uh, PEP, but uh, canine mass vaccination is much more uh, effective measure uh, in terms of policy because uh, canine mass vaccination is cheaper uh, and effective than relying on PEP in humans in the long run. You can imagine the reason why. Uh, you may feel that uh, Vaccinating dogs may, may be costly, uh, then target only human uh, vaccination. But if you don't vaccinate dogs, then uh, dog rabies frequently occur, then the bites to humans occur. So uh, because of the lots of uh, bite injuries uh, by dogs, then the people go to hospital for PEP, then the cost of treatment cost of prevention of human deaths uh, becoming very expensive. So this figure uh, shows uh, the simulation uh, of the cost. The y-axis uh, is average cost per DALI uh, averted, uh, while x-axis shows time in years. Uh, initially, the uh, cost uh, of uh, human PEP uh, can be expensive. And uh, if you start dog vaccination, the cost is um, increased, of course, because of that. However, the averted cost per daily uh, is there's a cross line when you continue four or, or five years, then uh, uh, the canine mass vaccination becomes cheaper than uh, simply relying on the PEP. So uh, I'm going to talk about the uh, target of uh, dog rabies. Uh, theoretical immunity thresholds is the proportion of uh, dog uh, population covered by the vaccination. Then when you reach it to uh, the, the immunity thresholds, then the probability of having uh, epidemic, large size epidemic becomes smaller. And uh, the herd immunity threshold is calculated by one minus uh, one over basic reproductive number. So or using the R0 uh, basic reproductive number uh, reported, uh, which is, uh, most likely between 1.1 to 1.7, then immunity threshold can be calculated uh, as below uh, around 40%. However, uh, the dog has uh, many uh, frequent high turnover. Uh, the one dog can bear uh, six, seven dogs, then the, you can imagine that those newly born dogs do not have uh, antibody, a vaccine antibody. So or even if you cover dog vaccination more than 40%, then in the next year, uh, then the, the proportion of immunity is becoming very low, easily. So, 70% uh, vaccination coverage is recommended. So this is the simulation how uh, even uh, the vaccination uh, can not prevent uh, the uh, dog rabies. In this case, it, it will surely uh, goes up. So 70% uh, of vaccination coverage is recommended. Uh, so before going to wildlife uh, talk, uh, uh, the world is suffering the difficulty in changing dog management style. Uh, this picture was taken in South Africa and uh, this was uh, in Vietnam and uh, it was uh, in Myanmar. Then in many countries, dog are kept uh, free so they can freely roam and stray. So uh, this table 
uh, shows uh, role of dogs in Vietnam. Uh, so people are keeping uh, dogs freely uh, because uh, they have a, they means dogs, dogs have a role as a guard. Uh, people say, if you tether dogs, then they cannot uh, chase uh, burglars, so they need to uh, keep them free. So this is one uh, reason. And uh, some uh, tribes, some areas uh, have a habit of eat dog meat uh, and they prefer non-vaccinated dog meat. So this, this is uh, such uh, uh, ethnic reasons of avoiding vaccinations uh, observed in many parts of the world. Okay. So then uh, this uh, figure shows uh, the results of structural equation modeling, which is the economic study by us. Uh, so we had a hypothesis that social status uh, is influencing the acquiring knowledge, collect knowledge of rabies. And when people uh, acquire correct knowledge on rabies, that can change attitude towards the disease. Then attitudes determine the practice uh, of uh, confinement uh, and birth control and vaccination of dogs. Then this analysis clearly showed uh, the minority ethnic group uh, has the low level of knowledge against rabies and they uh, lived in mountainous area and plain area were occupied by other major tribes and live food as well. And so uh, the poor uh, social status was uh, actually uh, connected to poor knowledge of rabies and which determined uh, the poor attitudes uh, towards uh, dog rabies controls. So uh, the key message uh, here uh, is uh, when we consider about the eliminating dog rabies and human rabies, we need to consider the sociological aspects as well and how to uh, provide a message to uh, entirely improve the knowledge and the attitude towards uh, dog rabies. Uh, again, so it's a co continuous uh, result from the previous uh, uh, study of rabies in Vietnam. And uh, surprisingly, it, it, this uh, figure shows the willingness to pay for vaccination. Uh, the x-axis shows the different uh, values in Vietnam dong, uh, the currency. Uh, and the y-axis shows the probability of uh, vaccinating and uh, paying that amount of money. So you, you can see uh, up to the very expensive uh, amount of money uh, when pe uh, people actually are aware about the danger of rabies, then they are willing to pay for vaccination. But the survival analysis shows uh, again, there are some people in mountainous area in uh, uh, a minority ethnic group who hesitate uh, paying for vaccination. So th this, this, this pro provides the spot, a geographical spot of, of dog rabies uh, still survive and uh, cause spillover to other uh, areas, uh, including those areas uh, practicing dog rabies vaccination. Okay, so uh, it, it was a, a background, sort of general background on rabies. Uh, then uh, I, I won't emphasize the importance of um, interdisciplinary approach, One Health, uh, which is the, this black line uh, connecting different disciplines, uh, medicine, veterinary medicine, social science, uh, environmental sciences, interdisciplinarity, and also, uh, we need to consider uh, the uh, collaboration between research policy and communities. Uh, and we, we need real information uh, of how people are thinking. 
uh, and this is called the transdisciplinarity. Uh, and the transdisciplinary approach uh, is called the eco health, including uh, ecological aspects uh, of disease. Now, okay, let, let me move on to uh, wildlife involvement in rabies. So this uh, figure by uh, Dr. Haydon uh, shows the different types of maintenance of rabies, uh, maintenance of any infectious disease. But let me explain uh, with the example of rabies. A, uh, here are humans and the, uh, those shaded areas, uh, reservoir population. Now you can see uh, the different uh, shape, wildlife and dogs. Uh, this square is maintenance population and uh, circle is non-maintenance population. So when rabies is uh, maintained, for example, in wildlife, then it can have an interaction with uh, dogs and uh, cause spillover to humans. And in the case of B, uh, so oh, it's the opposite. Uh, dogs, uh, uh, sorry. A is um, the when when the case dogs is uh, maintenance population, uh, which is the common feature of rabies. But other type of rabies can be uh, can take uh, B type. Uh, wildlife is maintaining and cause spillover to dog and humans. C uh, is in the case of uh, both dogs and wildlife species uh, maintenance population, which is the worst case, uh, worst case, actually, worst case. And uh, uh, sorry, D is the worst case, uh, both uh, dogs and wildlife. Uh, sorry, C is the worst case, yeah, maintenance populations are uh, dogs and wildlife. And the D uh, is uh, dogs and both dogs and wildlife, uh, non-maintenance population. Please uh, so remember this uh, throughout my talk. Okay, now I start uh, my talk on the South African study. Uh, the background, uh, canine rabies entered in South Africa in Limpopo province, which is here. Uh, in an epidemic started from Angola in 1950s. So there were no uh, dog rabies circulation, obvious dog rabies circulation um, up to 1950s, but it is said that the dog rabies uh, in cause incursion from Angola, those Namibia, Botswana, Zimbabwe into South Africa in this uh, year. Uh, however, mongoose rabies biotype uh, is also prevalent and I, I think they uh, stayed here. The objective of this study is to clarify spillover patterns of rabies between domestic dogs and wildlife uh, where vaccination for dogs and cats are mandatory. So they are uh, by law uh, uh, implementing uh, dog and cat rabies vaccination in South Africa. Now, materials and methods. Uh, study area uh, uh, is uh, two, three provinces, Limpopo, Mpumalanga, uh, Northwest uh, provinces, uh, and uh, this Kauten. Uh, includes Pretoria, which is the capital of South Africa. And we uh, worked on analysis uh, for 20 years uh, and data collection, uh, animal rabies data uh, were provided by uh, on the support veterinary research institutes, uh, including uh, virus uh, and the data. And human rabies uh, from National Institute of Communicable Disease and geographical and demographical information from statistical South Africa. And uh, for statistical analysis, uh, we conducted de descriptive uh, epidemiology and uh, spatial temporal clusters were detected by SATSCAM. And quantification uh, of transmission in the clusters, which means, uh, okay, so you can please imagine that first we try to identify where the hotspots uh, of dog rabies uh, places and the time. So after identify the, the epidemic of dog rabies by those clusters, 
then we measured how fast uh, the rabies sp spread was uh, using uh, effective uh, reproductive number. Uh, so when it comes to uh, the case that the, the population do not have uh, any uh, infection at the beginning, uh, entire population is susceptible, then we can use uh, basic reproductive number, which is R naught, R zero. But because, uh, as I explained, uh, in South Africa, they uh, do dog rabies vaccination. So we know that some unknown, unfortunately, unknown pro proportion of dogs were immunized by vaccination. So uh, we calculated uh, this effective reproductive number uh, in the clusters using this formula. Then the next question is, uh, what kind of ecological conditions uh, are facilitating dog rabies uh, and wildlife rabies? So to uh, understand that we focused on dog rabies uh, in relation to uh, ecological risk factors. So uh, we at first performed principal component analysis to combine the elements of uh, ecological factors by land use and uh, uh, estimated number of dogs uh, and the population density, uh, urban footprint uh, me means the uh, geographical uh, works, uh, global uh, efforts uh, in, uh, in visualizing uh, where are people living uh, on the map? And temperature and rainfall in driest season. And uh, we use the INLA uh, with zero inflated negative binomial errors to identify uh, the ecological uh, risk factors. And uh, the separately, uh, we worked on Bayesian phylogenic analysis of uh, animal rabies uh, virus uh, using BEAST uh, to uh, sort of uh, connect the molecular information into epidemiological information. Okay, so the results. Uh, the trends uh, of this figure shows trends of human, dog, and wildlife rabies in 20 years. Uh, the blue line shows uh, the trend of, of dog rabies, uh, y-axis is over here, and x-axis is here, and the human rabies, uh, the red line, and the green line shows wildlife rabies diagnosed uh, in the institute. So here, of course, we don't know or how many wildlife uh, actually died uh, be, due to rabies because it, it, is, it is not possible uh, to do that. But, but this pattern clearly shows first uh, relatively high level of uh, dog rabies incidence uh, in the year started observation 1998, uh, it declined first then you can see the clear, very steep uh, increase in 2005. Uh, then this was documented uh, that the incursion of dog rabies came from Zimbabwe. And uh, at, the, at this epidemic, human rabies uh, sharply increased, but soon dropped. And the human rabies uh, cases remained low after that, uh, but you can see uh, the some correlation between blue and green lines, which means there seems to be an interaction between dog rabies and wildlife rabies. Okay, so this uh, table shows uh, the type of animals diagnosed, diagnosed with rabies. Uh, of, co of course, uh, the, ma the most, the highest number of spe specimens submitted and the positive diagnosis uh, was from dogs. But you can see uh, lots of cattle cases and uh, different type of um, uh, domestic um, livestock uh, animals. 
and uh, of course uh, some variety of wildlife species and uh, many of them uh, are jackals and mangoes. Okay. Now let's have a look uh, at the geographical distribution, although uh, these animal rabies cases uh, include both uh, domestic and wildlife species of animals. Here, uh, we divided uh, the 20 years time series into four, so every five years uh, from left, top left, top right, and the bottom left and the bottom right. And the red uh, circle shows uh, positive cases with the larger uh, circle shows the higher number from, from the area. While yellow, shows the negative cases. Uh, can you see the shift of uh, rabies cases, the animal rabies from here, uh, slightly towards uh, Eastern part. And then uh, the next five years had a concentration in this area and the remained this area. Uh, but the last uh, final five years, you see uh, some uh, suddenly appeared uh, scattered rabies uh, the positive diagnosis records uh, from Northwest area. The human, those uh, figures shows uh, five uh, years each uh, figure of human deaths uh, as the, uh, those marks and background brown color shows dog rabies cases uh, you can hear you can see the number of cases so the from uh, 2005 uh, incursion of uh, dog rabies uh, from by jackal rabies in Zimbabwe into Limpopo as I explained and the human rabies cases occurred uh, here then uh, there are uh, detailed documents how people, uh, how the team, uh, veterinary team and the medical team worked together, taught, uh, exchange information each other, and uh, uh, dog uh, rabies education was also performed in the health centers. And uh, soon after that effort, uh, human rabies cases declined, but unfortunately there are sporadic uh, human diseases uh, afterwards. Then uh, this figure shows the clusters, spatio-temporal clusters of do dog rabies. So those C1, C2, C3, C4, those are the uh, dog rabies uh, clusters. And when there's, there are no circles, then that means the cluster only concentrated in the uh, address the as administrative unit. Then uh, the blue color shows the jackal rabies uh, and the green shows bat ear the fox. Uh, bat ear the fox rabies uh, are uh, somewhat independent of other type of uh, wildlife and dog rabies cases. Uh, but when there are uh, many jackal cases, it causes, uh, it is linked to uh, dog uh, rabies uh, clusters. And the mongoose rabies are quite common, but they are also independent. There's no so much shift uh, in the distributions. Uh, okay, then uh, let's have a look uh, at the speed of RT, uh, re effective reproductive number of those clusters. So re they are most likely uh, one to two. Uh, when you observe quite a high number, they are uh, related with a small number of cases. But those final northwest, uh, which is linked to wide, widely distributed jackal rabies, and simultaneously cause dog rabies in several locations and sh had the quite steep uh, increase of rabies. So. Uh, when, when you have uh, the wildlife rabies in jackals, uh, that, that can cause uh, simultaneous, at the same time, uh, 
uh, outbreak in dog rabies, which uh, brings quite steep hi high uh, speed of spread. This, this uh, shows uh, the beast results. Uh, interestingly, uh, over 60 years ago, there was a divergence uh, of uh, rabies virus uh, after in incursion from on Angola. Then, uh, so the group one, uh, AB, and so they, they showed divergence. Then this figure shows spiral over pattern. So uh, when you see dog rabies and BBJ is black buckled, black -buckled jackal, uh, so they, there are, uh, this uh, lineage is caused by uh, the variant uh, adopted in black buckled jackal, but uh, you can see the mixture of dog rabies. So uh, which shows the jump between species. Uh, uh, so it, it happens with between dog and black buck jackals, but uh, the, here, uh, Cybet, uh, this one uh, has only one. Uh, African Cybet cat uh, is a um, spillover species, is, so it's dead end. So the, uh, the Cybet cat doesn't uh, cause a sequential uh, spillover further. Okay, so let me explain the flow uh, briefly. Uh, so the first uh, five years between 1998 to 2002, uh, so oh, the rabies virus was maintained in jackal, but it causes spillover to dogs. Then uh, the in eastern part, uh, the other violent variant uh, causes dog rabies. Then in the next five years from 2004, uh, as I three uh, as I explained, uh, the large case uh, rabies occurred uh, in uh, by the this blue uh, one. So green, uh, I'm sorry, blue jackal uh, species remained, but uh, and green uh, is the jackal uh, variant. But when the dog rabies uh, entered, interestingly, entered by jackals in Zimbabwe. It enters to dog rab dogs, then causes rabies in dogs. Okay, so the, this is the jump uh, between species. Then in the next five years, uh, so another uh, movement uh, is uh, uh, rabies came from outside the area, uh, KwaZulu Natal, and the coast dog rabies. Then the final five years, as I explained, uh, this uh, variant uh, caused uh, rabies in black bat jackals and the spread through uh, in this area and caused uh, simultaneous uh, in infection outbreaks in dogs. So uh, you, you observe the uh, relationship between dogs and jackals. So both uh, species can maintain, but they exchange viruses. Uh, so uh, I, I shift to ecological analysis, uh, univariable analysis uh, results, uh, including Kruger National Park and excluding Kruger National Park, shows uh, the uh, low p-value uh, in principal component two, which is explained uh, by woodland, simply if I say, and pre precipitation, rainfall. Okay, then uh, this it was the, uh, around 2001 and the 10 years later uh, was also interestingly uh, PC2 uh, explaining woodland, same, and temperature and the precipitation. And uh, in, in, in this uh, time, dog population were included. Okay, so the multivariable analysis uh, results showed uh, in, this is the uh, Kruger National Park uh, excluded and uh, included uh, in 2001 and uh, 10 years after. 
then uh, PN uh, Kruger National Park excluded uh, in uh, 2001 and 2011. So in both cases, uh, you can see uh, the red area, uh, somewhat similarity. And in terms of statistics, uh, it explained, it was a, the risk was explained by high precipitation and high temperature in dry season. Uh, uh, which was uh, overlapped with subsistent farming zones with poverty. Uh, I, I showed the location of villages. So they overlap with the sociological factors. And wildlife in Kruger National Park are rabies free, but at higher risk because uh, this is a national park and closely linked with the poor poverty zones. Uh, there are uh, efforts in preventing rabies incursion into Kruger National Park. Uh, so this is the private uh, area attached to Kruger National Park. And the, 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 the services uh, guards uh, are checking the fence always. And when, when they identify dogs uh, going inside uh, the National Park, they, they shoot. Actually. Then examine rabies. Then by that effort, so far the dog rabies has not entered to wildlife population. Okay, so discussions. The spillover uh, rabies virus exchange occurs between domestic dogs and jackals. Uh, it was believed before that jackals cannot maintain rabies uh, without dogs, but jackals might have reached enough population to maintain rabies. Question is whether bait vaccine for jackals is needed. Mangus rabies is independent from canine rabies and has relatively lower risk to humans. And One Health F works, but sustainability is needed, which means you have observed the decline in human deaths due to rabies, but unfortunately those poor area stopped dog rabies vaccination. Then you have seen the, the uh, research of dog rabies cases and human deaths. And ecological risk predicted poverty zones, targeted dog management and the vaccination strategies are needed. Okay, so the finally, uh, towards zero by 30, uh, ecosystem and socioeconomics identify high risk areas and the reason is important. And one health preparedness and the response uh, is needed, uh, target that uh, dog vaccination, bait vaccination, management intervention should be planned. And global uh, collective actions to call for funding, uh, sustaining resources, particularly for uh, vaccination strategies uh, are important. Okay, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much. Professor Makita, for your wonderful presentation. Uh, before we move on to the next speaker, I have one quick question. As you already mentioned in your discussion, any possible strategies to uh, have a bait vaccine against the jackal or other wild animals, such as uh, the, the other scientists and researchers has tried in European continent. And have you looked at any uh, serum, uh, the antibody titer on JCA, in addition to that the virus detection? Uh, thank you very much for a wonderful uh, question. Uh, unfortunately, they have not got serum samples and nor antibody titers, and they are in the discussion of uh, how to. Uh, to make a strategies of using bait vaccine in both domestic, actually, and wildlife rabies. Thank you very thank much. You. Thank you again, Professor Makita. Okay, now we move to the next speaker, the Dr. Song Man Gi. He's a Deputy Director General, at the International Vaccine Institute. He's going to talk about preparing for the next pandemic vaccine development strategies. Please join me, welcome Dr. Song for his presentation.
Firstly, I would like to express great thanks to the organizers and also especially to the Professor Yongho Park for inviting me to this wonderful uh, symposium. Uh, today's my talk is uh, about uh, uh, preparing for next pandemic. Especially, I would like to talk uh, uh, how we uh, can prepare the next pandemic using uh, vaccine development and also vaccine deployment. Actually, uh, my major uh, works right now is uh, uh, supporting vaccine development. Uh, I'm working together with many private sectors. And yesterday, we have a big celebration uh, in SK Bioscience. Our, the first uh, successful data was come out, uh, phase three clinic trial data comes out um, from SK Bioscience. And we had a, a celebration together with the new president-elect uh, Yoon. Actually, uh, this was only, it takes only two years from the beginning of the development and the success of a phase three clinic trial. But many people say it's too late. It takes only two years. But right now, uh, I think two years too long. So even we uh, made a success in up to phase three clinic trial, now it, it's, it is too late. And because in uh, uh, this pandemic, uh, the first vaccine, it takes only 320 days from the identification of the sequence to the <clears throat> EUA approval. So I think uh, globally, uh, many experts and public and private and sectors, they are trying very hard to develop vaccines against emerging virus as early as possible. So I would like to talk Today, I don't want to talk what I am doing. I would like to talk about what the pub, especially the public sectors is want to do for uh, preparation for next pandemic uh, using vaccines. So this is the uh, list of the infectious diseases from 1900 to 2020. Uh, you know, I think many bars are familiar. Uh, Spanish influenza, it killed more than 50 millions, and West Nile, and Lassa fever, also Ebola virus, and HIV, and avian flu, and SARS. I remember the, how serious was the SARS year 2002. At the time, it didn't kill that many people, and it, it didn't impact that many people. But at the time, the panic was really huge globally. And then it, uh, it, its damage to economic you know, damage was huge. I think it, in my memory, it, it was first you know, but uh, infections which cause huge damage globally. And then you remember very well about uh, H1N1, swine flu, uh, year 2009. It was a uh, declared pandemic at the time. Then also MERS. MERS was firstly an outbreak in East, East Asia, but uh, it was a very big problem in Korea year 2015. And also after that, we have another pandemic, uh, Zika, especially in the South America area. So I think uh, as you knew here, there are many global serious infections uh, by viruses. But unfortunately, people uh, forgot very quickly. I think uh, when the pandemic or the serious infection comes, people say, oh, we need to invest a lot to develop vaccines or preventing this disease, but as I remember, I think they forgot just in a year. So right now, also this uh, COVID situation, uh, many people saying we need to invest a lot of money to prevent this pandemic. But I think uh, already many people uh, start forget forgetting the, uh, the importance of investment to prevent uh, next pandemics. And most of these viruses, as you knew, it's a zoonotic. And this virus, why there are so many uh, emergence of new viruses? I think you knew well, uh, evolution of infectious agent. I mean, the virus changes. And most of the virus is RNA virus, which cause serious global pandemic. So they are very easy to change their uh, uh, genomes. And also uh, the climate change. It's very serious, and now the uh, animals and host they move to the area where it uh, has been never been there. So I think this is one of the serious reasons why there are so many new virus comes, and also there are many economic development and land use and deforestation, and this also cause uh, exposure of new viruses. 
and increase of international travel. It's a dramatic increase. So also it enhanced the you know, infection. And these days also uh, by war, breakdown of public health system is very serious. I think this, uh, this is the uh, factors which can uh, attribute to the uh, why there's so many uh, emergence of new viruses these days. I think uh, w, including WHO and public sectors, they try to do something against these uh, new emerging viruses. So from year 2015, uh, WHO, they start to make uh, this blueprint list, uh, which is the prior title disease, which was, uh, can cause serious damage to human. And year 2015, uh, they uh, made uh, selected 10 viruses, which is uh, listed here, uh, Caribbean Congo, Ebola, Marburg, and Lhasa, MERS, SARS, and Nipa, and Zika. In year 2018, they added one, one more uh, called disease X because uh, people cannot expect which virus comes out. So over here you see the 10 is all RNA virus. That means uh, RNA can change very rapidly. Then it can cause very serious, you know, pandemics. So WHO uh, start. Uh, announced this list and that they uh, emphasized that we need to prepare uh, something for, for against these uh, uh, viruses. And also there are many well-known globally, very famous scientists, they are keep saying you need to establish a global vaccine development fund. So they uh, published uh, in New England Journal of Medicine year 2015, the importance of a uh, global fund to actually at the time they wanted to make fun to uh, for the Ebola crisis. But anyway, so this, uh, uh, through this effort, I think uh, Ebola vaccine was successfully developed. As you see here, uh, there are very serious outbreak in Ebola in year 2014 to 16 in West Africa, uh, killing more than uh, 11,000. So during this outbreak, uh, many scientists and uh, they tried to finalize Ebola vaccine. So first Ebola vaccine approved year to, uh, 2019, November. And then they also approved the next year, uh, year 2020 in Africa. So there are, this is a BSV, uh, vascular uh, stomatitis virus based vaccine. It showed a great efficacy uh, up to more than 90%. 90 to 100%. Then what was the strategy of Ebola vaccine development? A scientist uh, tried to understand what was the uh, strategy for this Ebola vaccine development. They found developed vaccines using many different diverse platforms. They tried many different kinds, like DNA or RNA or recombinant protein, and also viral vector-based vaccines. Actually, they tried almost all kinds. Then they developed vaccine up to phase two clinic trial. Then they stockpiled 100,000 doses. When the Ebola outbreak start, they start link vaccination, and it was as like a phase three clinic trial. And using this techno, uh, through this strategy, they can successfully uh, develop uh, Ebola vaccine. So right now there are two Ebola vaccines approved in Europe and America in Africa. Uh, both of them are viral vector based. One is a VSB, one is adenogenesis by Johnson and Johnson. So I think through this success, the global leaders uh, they get together in year 2017, 2017, and they declare the developing global fund together for the preparation of, uh, against emerging virus using vaccines. So at the time, they agreed to develop a CEPI. You knew very well about the CEPI right now, uh, called uh, Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness Innovations. 
the beginning, uh, this uh, CEPI was started from seven donors. Uh, Norway government, they uh, lead uh, this uh, establishment, and it originally in Oslo, in Norway. So they, uh, CEPI's mission is, uh, they think vaccines is uh, one of the most powerful tools in the fight against our, our smart epidemics and viruses, which can cha which change uh, very rapidly. And also they develop vaccines against emerging face disease and enable access to these vaccines for people during outbreak. So they want to develop vaccines and they want to use these vaccines during the outbreaks. I think this is perfectly fit to this uh, pandemic situation. And they started funding from this 2017. And this is first investors uh, from uh, seven investors. They collected uh, 1 billion uh, US dollars. After this uh, initiation, uh, they start support vaccine development against Lhasa, Mars, Nipah. I attended this uh, meeting at Oslo, uh, year 2019, and that this is the uh, result of the funding from year 2017. Actually, the as you see here, uh, they use many different platforms, viral vector, or DNA, or RNA, or recombinant protein. So, the, so as you see here, uh, CEPI funded not just a traditional vaccine platform, they start to fund new technology because they, they want to develop vaccine as quickly as possible and using new, new advanced technologies. They also uh, support international standard CERA because uh, this, uh, using this international standard CERA, uh, you can develop vaccines uh, very quickly and also you, you can evaluate the vaccine efficacy and you can compare each vaccine using this international standard CERA. This is very important. At the time, there is no international standard for MERS because the MERS outbreak mostly in South Arabia and Korea. And uh, they cannot secure the blood with high type of blood for, from the patient which were uh, impacted with MERS. So I contacted the CEPI and I said I can uh, collect the, the uh, blood samples from the uh, infected, infected patient. Then uh, CEPI funded this project. Uh, we started working together with the uh, uh, NIBSC and we successfully collected one liter from four patients from Korean patient, and year 2020, October, finally uh, WHO recognized this uh, serum as an international standard. And also, after this success, we also worked together to develop uh, SARS-CoV-2 international standard. Right now, almost all many uh, private sector, public sectors, they are now using uh, uh, this SARS-CoV-2 international standard for their vaccine evaluation. So this is a really uh, very difficult job, and also qualification and validation is really time consuming, and you, you need a huge investment. So from when the um, Korean private sectors, when they develop vaccines, most of the companies come to IBI, because IBI, only IBI has qualified and validated uh, FRNT, uh, neutralizing assay system. So we provide uh, that technology to KNH, and we work together to analyze uh, SK Bioscience uh, uh, Corona Vaccine Candidate. And after the outbreak of this uh, coronavirus, uh, CEPI funded many uh, different platforms and vaccine development. I think many vaccines are quite familiar to you, uh, Moderna, and also Oxford vaccines and Novavax. They are all uh, CEPI funded uh, vaccine uh, candidates. Uh, this is RNA and recombinant virus and recombinant protein. All were quite successful, but not all vaccine candidates were successful. As you knew here, the CureVac uh, is one of the uh, RNA vaccine, but they failed in phase three. They just uh, cannot meet the 50% of vaccine efficacy. They just uh, uh, less than uh, 50%. So the first uh, 
uh, cure back vaccine, they failed. And now they are in uh, uh, with uh, vaccine 2.0 is in the clinic trial. And in a DNA vaccine also uh, was not that much successful in clinic trial. And Queensland uh, recombinant protein vaccine, which is using the clamp technology. Unfortunately, uh, this vaccine was uh, uh, effective, very promising, but uh, they have the HIV protein uh, part. So they can uh, cause some problems with HIV diagnostics. So uh, uh, Australian government dropped uh, this program. Quite unfortunate. And recently, the Clover Pharmaceutical and SK Bios Science, uh, they announced the success in phase three clinic trial. This is uh, all uh, recombinant protein vaccine. And they can produce uh, 100 uh, million doses in a short, uh, short term. And it, uh, expecting uh, quite safe and effective in humans. So I think uh, as you hear, uh, CEPI funded uh, many different platforms and some of them is quite successful and they are in already in use and uh, also some of them is in uh, development stages. I think uh, this uh, pandemic situation, there are many different kinds of vaccines was developed and uh, is in use. Uh, this is the representative of vaccines which are now in use. As you see here, the protein, the recombinant protein vaccine, Novavax, is already in use. And RNA is the first uh, vaccine is in use uh, in this uh, corona pandemic uh, situation. So Pfizer and Moderna, uh, they made a huge success in uh, using uh, preventing the corona. And also recombinant virus, like uh, mostly uh, they are uh, using uh, adenovirus. Uh, four different companies, they are already in use. AstraZeneca, Kenshino, and JNJ, and Gamalea. They use different viruses, which have different characters. And also killed virus, mostly in China and India. They are uh, in use. So I think uh, for this corona uh, pandemic situation, uh, we used all possible you know, platform to develop vaccines as early as possible and as much as possible. This is the list of the uh, vaccine is on, uh, development and now in use. So already 23 vaccines in use and 10 vaccines in phase four clinic trial. And as you see here, more than 200 vaccines are in uh, development. I think it almost 1,000 vaccines, more than 1,000 vaccines in development in the, in globally. Uh, most uh, companies or research institutes, uh, they are developing, uh, develop uh, corona vaccine. And this is the, actually the, the vaccine development is time consuming and costs huge amount of money. How this corona vaccine development was so quickly? I think this is the example of the vaccine development. Typhoid fever costs more than 100 years. And normally vaccine development, it takes like 10 to 15 years. But as you knew here, uh, SARS-CoV-2 corona vaccine takes less than a year. How come we can develop the vaccines at this speed? And this is the timetable, uh, Pfizer, uh, BioNTech, uh, messenger RNA corona vaccine. Uh, I think they, from January, they identified the SARS-CoV-2 genome and then the preclinical study in mice they did uh, finish it in two months, and then immediately they start page one clinic trial. Before the end of this page one and clinic trial, they start page two, three clinic trials. It's overlap strategies. They can finish a uh, page three clinic trial. And also they start preparation of a mass production before the end of this page three clinic trial. Using this overlapping strategy, uh, they can make uh, this vaccine uh, use, emergency use approval in less than a year. And this is the uh, summary of the strategy, how they can, can develop vaccine so quickly. I think MERMS vaccine was the 
past test vaccine we, we developed, it takes four years. And then for this SARS-CoV-2 vaccine development, they used several strategies. As I said, uh, they used the uh, overlap uh, stage development simultaneously, and also they examined talk study, which uh, takes at least six months. Because uh, they give exemption, because uh, they use the same platform, which did uh, many, many times the clinic trial. So they knew this platform is safe in animal, at least, and they can uh, have enough clinic trial to pass the uh, talk study. For example, AstraZeneca vaccine, they used uh, this chimpanzee adenovirus and more than 30 times of clinic trials. So they, uh, English uh, government, they knew, UK government, they knew this uh, vector itself is safe in humans. So through the, through the mechanism, they can pass the talk study, which, cause, uh, which takes like more than six months. And also mass production, uh, they started before the end of the clinic trial. They prepared a mass production system. And also the uh, new platform, new platform technology, like RNA-based technology. And they uh, found this can be produced mass production in very small room, or more than a billion doses. So I think uh, through this uh, works, I think we can uh, successfully uh, produce vaccines uh, in a year. And also, as you knew, remember, the worldwide WHO and uh, each country regulatory agent, they collaborated very hardly. And also, huge amount of money was funded for, uh, to speed up uh, this vaccine, like warp speed in USA and other, many other countries. I think this is the factors how we can develop vaccines against SARS-CoV-2 in a year, less than a year. Uh, this is also a summary how we can develop. And also, I think uh, to reduce the vaccine development time, you can have some strategies. If you have new the target, you can develop vaccine up to page two clinic. You can finish up to page two clinic trial and then stockpiling, as we did for uh, Ebola vaccine development. Uh, through that uh, mechanism, you can develop vaccine as early as possible. And CEPI now, they are uh, announced a very ambitious, ambitious plan. The first vaccine, it takes around 300 days. Now they are saying vaccine developed in 100 days. This is called CEPI 2.0. So they want to prepare the candid, uh, against the emerging viruses and known epidemic and pandemic threat, and they wanted to use uh, novel technology or uh, this technology to prepare for this pandemic, uh, uh, against the next pandemic. So this is a suggestion uh, how they can prepare uh, next pandemic uh, with 100-day uh, missions. The first is scientific advancement. And they can use uh, vaccine, they can make vaccines against a uh, uh, library of viruses. Like, uh, they personally, they want to try like uh, 20 uh, viruses and rapid response vaccine platform. The RNA vaccine, you can develop vaccines like in a few days. Then you can mass produce also in a month, something like that. So I think uh, uh, using this new technology, they can produce vaccine. Uh, very in very short uh, term. And also, they can develop some system, uh, full deployment of advanced analysis and AI to uh, de-risk and accelerate the development. So they can use the uh, new uh, scientific advance, advancement. And also, they can develop more excel excellence and global surveillance. Uh, they can predict which virus uh, can emerge and can be problem. And also, uh, CEPI also developing uh, international standard together with the many public sectors. Uh, I also uh, want to express my, uh, I also 
suggested to develop international standard SFTS to the NIBSC, and they agreed. But unfortunately, uh, because of this SARS-CoV-2, uh, the project was delayed. I think we can start after this SARS-CoV-2 uh, pandemic come down. So I think uh, and that kind of a strategy also can in, uh, help to enhancing the vaccine development strategy. And also you can uh, try global clinical trial uh, infrastructure and readiness. I think uh, because of this uh, clinic trial, delays of clinic trial, I think many vaccines were uh, developed itself delayed quite seriously. And most, uh, one of the most important thing is a regulatory agent. I think uh, if you, uh, you can get uh, quick uh, approval from regulatory, I think we, uh, vaccine development can be, uh, like we can develop actually quickly. And also the, one of the most big problem is funding. I think uh, the vaccine development and all, all activities, it costs huge amount of money. But after this success, I mean, when this pandemic come down, I'm pretty sure the most of the government uh, will hesitate funding uh, this for CEPI, I guess uh, at least $3.5 billion required for uh, preparing for this pan uh, next pandemic. I think uh, right now, the CEPI have three uh, strategies to speed up the vaccine development in 100 days. And they wanted to have uh, $3.5 billion. And then they wanted to have some network uh, with vaccine developers and vaccine manufacturers and CDMOs and tech transport training providers. So I think uh, Korea also joined this EOI and CEPIS, and IBI is uh, uh, connecting and networking all these Korean partners to CEPI. So we connect all these private and public and collaborators in Korea. Uh, we joined and agreed to CEPI's uh, to meet the CEPI's mission and uh, task. So I think through this kind of international collaboration and mechanism, we can speed up uh, vaccine development. Even you can develop vaccines in 100 days, there are other problems. I think uh, the vaccine deployment was unequal. As you see here, the high income countries there are at least 83% of people vaccinated, but in low-income countries, only 21% vaccinated. And this is very serious. As you see here, the CEPI and Gavi and WHO, from the beginning, they made called COVAX. So philosophy of this COVAX is vaccinate equally all the population, which high-risk population, at least 20%. They aimed equal equal distribution of vaccines, but unfortunately, uh, this ambitious project was not going that well. So right now, I think they vaccinated 1.4 uh, billion. Up to now, uh, in globally, more than 11.5 billion shots given. So it's only 15 percent totally given to the uh, uh, 145 countries. But I think that uh, next, next pandemic, we need to uh, consider how you can achieve this equal uh, distribution of vaccine. And this is very serious because uh, as you knew quite well, the new virus comes very often in uh, endemic areas. I think you can also uh, put together all the effort uh, to equal distribution of vaccines. I think uh, Korea government and WHO, we have a plan. We can, from the beginning, we, we want to produce vaccines in that area. Because right now, as you knew, there is no, max no vaccine production in Africa, in ASEAN, many con poor countries. So I think that also causes huge inequality in vaccine distribu distribution. Very fortunately, Korea can produce huge amount of vaccines and you also export the vaccine to globally. We provide the vaccine globally. But right now, uh, this uneven vaccine production is very serious. The problem is there is no technology and there is no people 
in a low income country. So, Korea government, and together with the IBI, we announced the training program for low income and low and middle income countries. So, we are in development of this program. So, uh, we are now in uh, working together with many Korean partners to develop a vaccine uh, training program, introductory course, and GMP or GLP, GXP program. You are in development. And also, we have a very good system with the G, uh, MOOC. GMP, so we, have, we can have eight weeks of uh, uh, training program on site. And then we can, after this training, we can take transfer of each vaccine. It, if they want, uh, it, if the low middle income country, if they want, we can transfer vaccine to the people who train in, through this program. I think uh, right now, the many countries and uh, globally, uh, they wanted to produce vaccine uh, just to peel and finish using peel and finish, not you know from the beginning. Through this peel and finish technology, they can uh, distribute as early as possible. And year 2015, global bio campus. I think in Korea wanted to build this global bio campus. Over there, they uh, they can train and. From the beginning to GMP, I think everything uh, in one one places. I think through this kind of mechanism, we can uh, make uh, low income, low and middle income countries uh, produce vaccine, have uh, expert in vaccine uh, productions and vaccine development. And this is very amb ambitious and it it take a long time because uh, we tried several uh, many times to train them, but it was not that, that much successful. So through this uh, mechanism, uh, IBI and WHO and Korea government uh, wanted to the enhance the deployment of vaccines in low-income countries, uh, make them uh, produce vaccine by themselves. And this is my last slide. Uh, how come you can uh, prepare for next pandemic? Actually, as, you, as I said, we can uh, use this uh, self-production in low and middle income countries. Also, we can uh, develop vaccines with top priority, at least 20 priority disease. And also, we can develop universal vaccines against this COVID-19. Uh, globally, there are many candidates is uh, now uh, showing good uh, result. And also, we can reduce the vaccine develop timeline as like uh, next pandemic, like 100 days. And also we can, now we found the global collaboration is the essential part to enhance uh, global uh, preparedness. I think through this effort, we can have a better, you know, uh, better strategy for next pandemic. Uh, thank you very much for your listening. Thank you very much. Dr. Song, for your wonderful presentation about vaccine development and strategies in the future against the generic infectious diseases. Uh, now we still have a few more minutes before we move on to the last speaker. I would like to ask one very quick question. Uh, could you define more details how that uh, international standard theater against uh, the, the coronavirus or uh, MERS virus? Yeah, uh, so actually for MERS virus, uh, the first thing is we need to very high titer patient serum. So at the time, uh, NIBSG and WHO, they want to collect the very high type serum. Unfortunately, in globally, only South uh, Saudi Arabia and Korea was that was possible, but unfortunately Saudi Arabia yeah, they cannot get any blood serum from Saudi Arabia. So Korea was the only possible option to collect large amount. So I contacted medical doctors who treat, treated the patient, and then I found they are uh, agreed to provide their you know blood samples. So I then I contacted CEPI and NIBSC. Uh, Korea can provide at least one meter very high tide sample. And then NIBSC, they make uh, at least 90% uh, WHO international standard serum. 
So they uh, asked globally many laboratories. So at that time, the seven laboratories worked together to develop uh, this in, uh, internet standard serum. So I think, as I remember, they used ELISA and neutralizing assay mm -hmm. and pseudovirus assay using this internet standard serum. Through that mechanism, uh, NIBC uh, successfully announced the success of a MERS, MERS uh, internet standard serum. And the same team and also at least 40 teams get together to develop a SARS-CoV-2 internet standard serum. And over there, uh, I think at the time the serum was enough because uh, globally uh, many uh, infections. So uh, through that activity, you can develop uh, SARS-CoV-2 internet standard serum. I, I, I heard it's a world record speed. But the problem of SARS-CoV-2 is many barriers. So also uh, NIBC also wanted to develop uh, internet sensor against these uh, many different barriers. We also participate uh, up to Delta strain. So I think uh, very soon uh, many internet sensor serums to against the uh, variant also available. Thank you very much, Dr. Song. Now we move to the uh, last speaker this morning, uh, Professor Song Dae-sop from the Seoul National University is going to talk about the spillover infection of new emerging viruses and uh, preparedness with uh, nanobiotechnology convergence technique. Please join me. Welcome Professor Song for his presentation. The topic of my talk is about nanobiotechnology for diagnosis and vaccine against disease X. The disease X means uh, unexpected viral disease. Actually, uh, today my content is included uh, is introduction and the description about the disease X and the description about the coronavirus infection. And the main part is covered with the nanobiotechnology for diagnosis and vaccine and uh, adjuvant and treatment, and the final part covers the uh, cell line development for COVID-19 in vitro test. Actually, as you know, disease X means unexpected infectious disease. Uh, looking at the past histories, there are records of damage caused by numerous infectious diseases. In particular, after the 21st century, a wide variety of new infections have arisen, raising concerns. And recently, the COVID-19 is a, a second pandemic infection, uh, the third very tragic disease caused by human coronaviruses. Uh, from the 2018, the disease was uh, announced by the WHO. Actually, uh, every two or three years, WHO announced the prior, prior prioritizing disease for the research and development in emergence context. The, uh, the real name of the virus is including Crimean Congo and Ebola and Lassa fever, etc. However, from 2018, the DGGX was the first uh, announced because of the X means unexpected disease. So because of the uh, some SARS and uh, Ebola and Zika, that kind of very new viral disease was arisen. Because of that, uh, WHO uh, announced the disease X because X uh, stands for the uh, unexpected. So, this unexpected disease, the disease X, is an uh, unexpected infectious disease. This kind of disease can could kill millions of people, and uh, unfortunately, the COVID-19 is the first example of the disease X. So, what's the fundamental reason of the, this kind of new viral disease? Because of the rapid urbanization. For example, the Amazon jungle was destroyed by the rapid de development by the, some people. So, uh, the wildlife animals uh, can uh, meet the human interface uh, before the, this kind of a rapid urbanization, 
the human animal interface was very uh, have a, a long distance. However, uh, because of the, this kind of the development, the human animal interface was so close. So this could be the fundamental reason of the uh, recent uh, recent uh, new viral disease emergence. And uh, uh, so, uh, who did did cross the line? I think the human crossed the line. So because of this kind of uh, reason, uh, the new viral disease was arising so frequently. So recently, the Nature published one very interesting paper about the genetic cost diversity increased in human dominated ecosystem. Uh, actually, frankly speaking, the rapid urbanization and the destruction of the wildlife uh, can could increase the emergence of new viral disease. However, the, in this paper, they demonstrate the uh, real uh, relationship between the rapid urbanization and the ur emergence of the new viral disease. So uh, after the uh, rapid urbanization like this, they have a very significant uh, increment, increment about the emergence of the new viral disease in terms of uh, avian and uh, bat and uh, some primate uh, species. So besides of these this reasons, the big farming, big farming also is also the one fundamental reason for the emergence of the new viral disease. The, as a reference of a big farms make big flu by the rob wallace, uh, this kind of uh, big farming uh, can induce the uh, mass production of livestock. This kind of mass production, they can induce the infectious infection rate increment and the virulence and the uh, recombination and the immune suppression and the pressure of antigen changing. So uh, this kind of big farming can uh, could be the fundamental reason of the new emergence of the virus. And as I mentioned previously, the human-animal interface should have a long distance. However, when they have a, uh, when they have a destruction of the barrier between the animal and the human, so they can uh, have a speed over infection. The speed over means uh, the interspecies transmission. For example, so many kind of viruses and bacteria, even the parasite, can uh, can have a speed over infection interspecies transmission uh, like uh, this kind of examples and so that's why i i want to i want would like to emphasize once again the importance of one health concept so one has to one medicine means that is human animal and environment is closely related in terms of the uh, health and in terms of the infection so which is the most important concept which is, is the most important concept as a basic background to respond to viral infection. Actually, this cartoon, I think this illustration taken from an article recently published in Nature is the most appropriate cartoon to show the relationship between the coronaviruses and One Health. There are so many uh, natural infections, natural coronavirus infections of uh, pigs and the ferret and the bat and uh, even though the companion animal cats. So, the, this cartoon emphasizes again about the one health concept. And as I mentioned previously, uh, uh, for example, the coronavirus have a very various characteristic. Uh, even though so many animals, uh, even the pigs and cat and dog and the bat, uh, even though there's some whale, they have uh, their own coronavirus infection. So that's why uh, the, it is uh, it is so difficult to have a preparedness, right preparedness against the uh, coronavirus disease because of they, they are so various. And uh, for example, in some animal species, they have a respiratory infection by the coronavirus. However, in other species, they have a digestive infection. So, so that's why, that's why it is so difficult to have a right preparedness against the uh, coronavirus infection. And also, we should take, take into consideration about the re or the re emerging or the emerging viral disease, including the avian 
and human influenza virus, especially about the uh, AI that is highly pathogenic, uh, avian influenza virus, that could be the main causes of the death after the infection in humans. And also, uh, the, recently, well, PNAS have a publication about the ranking, the risk of animal to human spill of a newly discovered viruses. Contrary to our expectation, uh, the SARS-CoV-2 is the second, second. However, the Rasa fever was the, was picked as the uh, most dangerous disease. So that's why we have a very, uh, concrete and very uh, right preparedness against uh, uh, this kind of new viral disease. So I think that this paper emphasized the needs for a broad and more active response to new infectious disease. And second part, as a main body of the uh, my talk, I want to talk about the nanobiotechnology for the preparedness of a body new viral disease. Actually, as you know, the right diagnosis and the prevention with the vaccine and the treatment with the antiviral is the most important principle against the uh, infectious disease. So for the making of a good diagnosis and good vaccine and good antiviral, we apply the nanobiotechnology. Actually, because of the, it's a fundamental characteristic of the nano size material, the nano, nanotechnology can be applied to so many fields, including material, electronics, and healthcare and environment. Uh, recently, because of the, its uh, characteristic in terms of size, uh, they have many applications to the healthcare, including antibody and viruses. For example, uh, the polymer, because of its uh, size similarity, they have has a mimicry with the polymer to the DNA, and their organic and inorganic membrane can be have a mimicry against the viruses envelope and membrane. Also, the nanoparticle can have a mimicry against the viruses. So, because this kind of characteristic, they can be applied to many detection and diagnosis and vaccine and uh, even to though the adjuvant. So, uh, recently. Uh, we have a very interesting fi found findings for the differential diagnosis between the highly pathogenic and the low pathogenic avian influenza viruses. Before starting to the description of the, this technology, let's let's see the uh, one movie clip. Uh, sorry. Uh, I'm sorry, but the movie clip did not work. So and uh, because of uh, 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 I'm so sorry about the, some error of the page. I want to disc description involve her. Uh, actually, uh, the HPAI and the mm, low pathogen influenza virus have a fundamental difference uh, in the sequence of the hemagglutinin. The HPAI have uh, multi-basic, polybasic site in the hemagglutin. However, the low pathogenic influenza viruses have uh, no polybasic site. That's, that's the fundamental difference between the highly pathogenic and low pathogenic. So because of this characteristic can be the applied to the differential diagnosis. So when we treated the furin enzyme that is very uh, existed abundantly in the whole of the body, uh, they can be cleaved. However, when we apply the, when we treat the trypsin that is uh, localized in the respiratory tract, respiratory organ like uh, lung, uh, the only the uh, LPAI can be cleaved into the HA1 and HA2. Because of this characteristic, when we treat the trypsin or the furin to the virus, and when we react it with our, this kind of flusome that is, uh, designated as uh, like uh, mimicry of the cell membrane. Inside of this flusome, they have a uh, fluorons. So when they reacted with uh, this kind of fluorons, the highly pathogenic viruses, when they treated to the furin and the trypsin, they have a uh, light on like this. However, when the, if we treated the, this two kind of enzyme to the low pathogenic viruses, only the uh, trypsin have a uh, turn on the this flusome. So because of 
uh, with the this kind of difference when uh, when we apply this kind of uh, uh, enzymes they have a difference differential diagnosis as a, like a traffic sign so when we apply this technique to the highly pathogenic influenza and low pathogenic influenza viruses we have a very fast and a very sensitive diagnosis and also we can have a differential diagnosis so for uh, this is the first first trial of the application of the nanovirus technology uh, to the uh, detection of the virus and the second part uh, recently we updated we upgraded the previous technique so in the flu germ, the cell mimicry germ, nano germ, we apply the viral receptors the sur on the surface of the, this germ. So uh, because of this technology, we upgraded, we had a better sensitivity and uh, have a quantitation uh, after the uh, application of this kind of technology. So this is a uh, uh, impressed paper. So. Uh, with this technology, we can have a, we can have a, a better uh, sensitivity and the specificity against uh, for the, the right detection of the and the right differential diagnosis between the HPAI and LPAI. And uh, the second trial of our, of our application to the uh, nanovirus technology to the viruses, the self assembled vaccine with the uh, uh, polyethylene glycol and the uh, lactide and the uh, polylactic acid of this kind of polymers, we have a treatment, we have a, a reaction between the subunit antigens. So they have self-assembled. So this, this self-assembled vaccine have a great advantage in terms of immunogenicity and the making of the humoral immunity. So with this technology, we can have a universal platform for the making of the vaccine, for example, COVID-19 vaccine, also we have a virus mimetic structure. And uh, uh, this technology, the self-assembled vaccine, can have, uh, uh, cell, uh, we call this self-assembled vaccine presenting antigen on the surface, improves the antigen recognition by immune cells. That's why we have a significantly higher immune response uh, after the uh, application of this kind of vaccine. And when we apply the, this concept to the influenza vaccine, we have a sing, uh, significant higher immune response after, in terms of uh, uh, humor immunity. And in the real challenge test, uh, we have a better uh, safety and we have a better uh, survival rate after the real viral ch challenge in mouse models. And also we apply this nanobiotechnology to the adjuvant. So uh, as you know, the, the very famous adjuvant, the, you know, adjuvant it can be the uh, great help to enhance the immune response when we uh, add this uh, to the vaccine antigens. The Novartis have uh, its own uh, MF59 adjuvant that called it, we, we called it Adabox. So with the mimicry to the MF59, we have a new adjuvant based the squalene and uh, we have, uh, we call it Cascua. That is a cationic polymeric nanoparticle containing squalene. So also after the real challenge in the mouse model, we have a very uh, significant uh, uh, higher, uh, higher protection after the real virus challenge. Now, recently, we made a co-delivery of an antigen and immunostimulant via polymerism uh, as a vaccine adjuvant for potent immune response. Uh, also, we apply the polyethylene glycol and polylactic acid as a polymers, and we add MPRA also in the, for making the adjuvant. So with this delivery system, we can have a better uh, immune response and a better protection uh, when we apply this technique to the vaccines. So the next part, uh, this is a big, uh, although this is not the uh, genetic disease, the, for example, PED, person epidemic diarrhea disease is a devastating disease in the uh, pig industry because this virus can kill uh, baby pigs in 100%. So uh, actually almost 20 years ago, I registered one oral vaccine for the first time in the world. Uh, after the attenuated viruses. So uh, this is the oral vaccine. So 
uh, this is uh, this vaccine is destroyed in the gastric acid. So uh, when we apply the polycathionic amino acid, uh, they can be protected against the gastric acid. However, they have a pH sensitive amino acid coating. So when they entered to the small intestine, they have an uncoating. So they have a very great immune response in the small intestine. So uh, when we apply this oral vaccine to the oral, they have a very great resistance against the gastric acid. And, however, when they enter the, the small intestine, they have an uh, uncoating by the polymer. So they have a very great immunogenesis and they can induce the uh, immune, uh, mucosal immune response. So uh, although this is not genetic disease, this kind of oral vaccine adjuvant, oral vaccine delivery system could be the uh, one mucosal adjuvant. And uh, recently, we have also uh, botrol and the simultaneous visualization after the uh, after we uh, insert fluorescence into the virus and uh, some nanogram. So we, with this technology, we, we can have a simultaneous visualization uh, in of the early stage of infection. So for example. Oh, uh, we have a body uh, body and the DID. We have a fluorescence in the viruses with DID and also body based uh, nanogram. Or uh, with this uh, to the fluorescence system, we can trace. We can trace the viral moving. So, for example, there are four types of dengue virus. Dengue virus type one, two, three, four. After that, we have a fluorescence nanogram application. We can simultaneously trace. The virus like this so we can have a movie clip every virus infection step so with this uh, technique we can have a visualizing of the virus movement so this technique can be used for the rapid screening of the antiviral system because there are so many candidates of the antiviral when we have a candidate of the antiviral system when we input uh, this is system in the screening of the antiviral, we can easily, we can easily check the uh, mode of infection, mode of uh, uh, action of the antiviral uh, after the visualization of the virus movement, because we can easily check the uh, tackle and the blocking of the virus movement and the virus infection by the visualizer. And uh, with this uh, recent uh, achievement uh, in terms of diagnosis and the uh, vaccine prevention and uh, e even though there's some antiviral treatment uh, we can summarize all this technology and uh, recently we had the paper in the advanced material uh, named the advanced nanomaterials for the preparedness against the re-emerging viral disease and uh, as a uh, uh, because of the uh, fundamental characteristic of the nanobiotechnology, we can have a good preparedness and we can have a good application against a new emerging disease X and also even though the mutant in the influenza and the SARS-CoV-2 including Omicron and the Delta and the Alpha, uh, something like that. And also we can have a re, uh, good preparedness against the re-emerging disease together. So uh, the next, when I have uh, uh, one more one more opportunity to have a presentation about the nanobiotechnology in the future. Uh, I, will, I will have a very detailed description about our advanced technology uh, after this presentation. So as a final part, I want to describe the cell line development for COVID-19 virus vaccine and the antiviral system. As you know, in vivo, in vivo test is the, uh, more, more appropriate and the, more important experiment. However, uh, in in vivo experiment and in vivo trial, uh, there are so many obstacles. So instead of that, uh, we we prefer the in vitro test. However, there are fundamental difference between the in vivo and in vitro test in terms of COVID-19 research, especially because there are so many difference between the in vitro and in vivo test. So uh, for the connection, the very uh, a good connection between the in vivo and in vitro test. Recently, uh, we made uh, we made the seven primary cells from the animal. Uh, the not the cancerizing uh, immortalized cell. We modified the telomerase. Telomerase uh, 
modification, we made an immortalized cell from the porcine bronchial uh, and ferrotracheal, ferrobronchial and guinea pig, and the golden seed and hemp tracheal and bronchial. So with this, uh, with this technique, we made uh, seven uh, new cell lines. Uh, with these cell lines, we made uh, a very good reproduction of the COVID-19 viruses. And uh, instead of the animal infection, before the real animal in vivo test, we tested the uh, vaccine and we tested antiviral in the cell line from the real animals. So with these cell lines, we can have a very good reproduction before the in vivo test. So uh, I think this is a very good approach for the uh, entering the in vivo test ahead. So recently also with this tech similar technology, uh, we inserted, we inserted in the uh, African green monkey kidney cell, we inserted the human receptors. Uh, for example, for COVID-19, uh, human ACE2 or the uh, TMPR SS2 receptors with this insertion of the um, receptors, we have a very good uh, higher induction, good replication. Uh, compared to the prototype cell lines, we have a very good replication of the viruses. So with this kind of technology, we have a very good uh, reproduction of the virus and the replication of the viruses. So this, this could be the good platform. This could be the good material for the research of the COVID-19 research. So uh, as a summary, as a summary, uh, we should we should prepare for the next viral disease X with the uh, interdisciplinarity. Interdisciplinarity means uh, nanotechnology combined biotechnology, so nanobiotechnology. So differential diagnosis and self-assembled vaccine and virus tracking and development of the adjuvant were the examples of nanobiotechnology and also nanobiotechnology could be the good application for the good preparedness against the vi new viral uh, digit X. So, thank you for your attention. And uh, uh, I'm sorry. The next part, next part is uh, uh, thanks to and uh, uh, acknowledgement of my study. All this study was done by my myself. Uh, all this work is done with uh, our great collaborator uh, in the Seoul National University and then Jeonnam National University. Also, the Professor Han from the Yonsei University have a greatest support to this nanobiotechnology. Thank you for your listening. Thank you very much, Professor Song, for your recent uh, development of nanobiotechnology. Uh, as we all know, there's a four O, O's is a quite uh, the, the popular uh, in this uh, situation, first one is nano, second one is robo, third one is info, and finally bio. So four, bi four O's going to be a very critical uh, role in the future uh, technology. Thank you very much. Before we move the panel discussion, I would like to add one quick question to Professor Song. You mentioned about that uh, differentiation with high pathogenic avian influenza versus low pathogenic avian influenza by trypsin treatment, whether the, the gene turn on and turn off. However, we need more detailed application uh, to define the high pathogenic uh, the virus through the uh, pathogenicity uh, trial in vivo or cell line. Have you looked at that, uh, uh, those uh, the, the gene level versus in vivo application uh, to define the pathogenicity? Uh, thank you for your good question. Can you, Can you hear me? Can you hear me well? Yes, yes. Yeah, actually, as you mentioned, as you mentioned, uh, uh, conventionally, uh, when we check the highly pathogenic influenza virus, uh, we should inoculate the uh, embryonated egg uh, after the isolation of the virus, and then also after the isolation of the virus, we sh should check the uh, gene sequence with the uh, very highly pathogenic polybasic site motif. But uh, our technique just uh, focus on the, the multi-basic, polybasic site. So uh, after we uh, have a positive to the highly pathogenic virus, uh, when we have a confirmation, 
that is a highly pathogenic, we should have a conventional method one more time. However, uh, if we have a very rapid diagnosis in the field, uh, although we don't have a confirmation with the conventional method, we can have uh, some biosecurity and the action of the uh, some um, not spreading to the uh, adolescent <laughs> uh, farm. So that's why we, we prepare this kind of platform. And uh, how, however, uh, as you mentioned, for the confirmation with the OIE standard, we should have a confirmation test with the conventional classical method. Thank you very much, Professor Song. Okay, now we will move to the panel discussion. I really appreciated the both speakers this morning for your excellent contribution uh, to this uh, wonderful uh, international webinars on global climate change, and especially today on the genetic infectious diseases. Had a few number of questions uh, shown in the chat box. So I have to pick up some questions and then ask it to the speakers. Uh, first question is, uh, uh, can we uh, vaccinate against uh, the uh, animal or plant rather than human to uh, to prevent the disease. I would like to ask you to uh, Dr. Song Man Gi and uh, also uh, Professor uh, Song Desa for this question. I think uh, several vaccines, which is uh, quite generic, like uh, rabies, uh, they vaccinate uh, uh, animals because of the carries uh, like a uh, raccoon or, you know, so I think uh, uh, several vaccines already in use in animals but no plant. I think why you are mentioning plant, I don't understand. But anyway, so, uh, and also, I mean, I think you are asking also like uh, other viruses like uh, influenza, but influenza, only avian influenza, they vaccinate only the, you know, poultry. So I'm not sure what your question, but we are doing some of the pathogens uh, immunizing both animals and humans, uh, it, depending on the, uh, situation and uh, risk, yeah. I think uh, my answer is like that. Yeah. Thank you. Professor, <clears throat> you, can you add? Yeah, uh, addition, uh, addition to the uh, Dr. Song's uh, answers. Actually, that's a very uh, difficult question because uh, as you know, uh, it is easy to vaccinate the genetic disease uh, again, uh, to the animal instead of human, however, and in the animal vaccination, we should take consideration about the, some economic uh, rate and uh, some the re, uh, some force. Now, if we focus on the vaccination to the animal, uh, they can drive drive have a driving force to make a uh, mutate the virus. For example, in case of highly pathogenic influenza viruses, so uh, we should we should take a policy uh, with the uh, human vaccination and animal vaccination and the uh, uh, slow, uh, test and slaughter policy together. So it's a very, very complicated and complex uh, subject. So uh, I cannot uh, conclude with a very simple uh, result. So uh, so the, my, my, uh, my suggestion is uh, not just a simple vaccine to the animal instead of human, just we should have a very uh, wide preparedness with uh, uh, human vaccination and animal vaccination. Sometimes we should have uh, test and slot and the stamping out policy. Thank you very much. That's the reason. Can I? Can, okay. Professor can I Wu? say? Yeah. yeah can yeah, I say please, say please, something please. to this yeah. question? For for um, in my perspective, vaccination of human is one thing. Vaccination of animals is another. Um, Vaccination of animals, one ca ca cannot replace vaccination of humans because many a times you can't vaccinate every single animal. So if there are some animals that are kind of unvaccinated, particularly if the disease involves wild animals. For domestic animals, it's kind of easier to vaccinate, but for wild animals, it's very, very difficult to catch every single animal in the wild. So there are definitely a lot of animals in the wild that are unvaccinated. So if the disease is transmitted from a wild animal to human, then 
certainly it is impossible to uh, substitute human vaccination with just the animal vaccination. But I guess the two things can be done kind of uh, simultaneously in order to get uh, uh, good protection. Thank you, Professor Wu. <laughs> so, Professor Makita, you have an uh, experience in rabies virus, uh, so you may add some comment on this. Yes, uh, I, I, I'm very happy with the good question. And uh, to understand the ecology uh, is very important. Uh, as uh, Professor Wu mentioned, when you talk about uh, wildlife, uh, we need to consider is really wildlife uh, is uh, making influence to uh, the disease ecosystem, it's a disease ecology. So if uh, it is not significant impact, we, we don't need to do that. We can concentrate on domestic side. But if it is um, unavoidable, uh, use of vaccine, uh, it becomes quite effective in, in the case, for example, uh, rabies in Europe, foxes. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, I move to the second question. Is asking one of the participants, how that the relationship with the COVID-19 outbreak with uh, food system or uh, eating uh, habit? Anyone, uh, if you ha want to, to answer that question, please uh, recognize yourself with the hands or anything. Okay, okay. Professor Wu, thank you. Um, this is a difficult question because um, nobody has done a good um, investigation on the origin of COVID-19. Now, you know, when COVID-19 first emerged, the uh, people thought that it came from the um, sort of wildlife market in Wuhan. But then um, there are a lot of rumors saying that it probably may not be from the wildlife market. Some people say it may be from the lab in Wuhan and so on and so forth. So what, um, what, 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 what should be done actually is of course an investigation uh, on the various um, animals as well as the patients who suffered from COVID-19, particularly the, the very, very first few patients who suffered from COVID-19. But somehow uh, no such investigation could be performed. And somehow uh, a lot of the sort of um, evidence that uh, may lead to a good investigation have been destroyed. So, so, so we remained um, in the unknown, totally unknown about the origin of SARS coronavirus 2, whether it is um, from nature whether it is from the lab, if it is from nature, what animals, if it is from a lab, whether it is um, uh, 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 from, a, from, from a natural virus or from an engineered virus, still there is, there's nothing that, 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 that can be said firmly on this particular issue. So, um, to answer the question on whether it is related to food, uh, the, the answer is uh, we do not know. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Wu. I may add uh, to your answer. Uh, in our experience, we uh, suspicious, suspect, suspected that the Ebola virus through the bushmeat consumption in the Africa can contribute to that kind of uh, problem uh, through the, uh, the eating habits. Okay, Professor Mokita, Makita, would you add? Yes, uh, yeah, I, I would like to mention uh, about this issue uh, from different aspects. Uh, so, uh, as a, I'm a veterinarian and I uh, talk uh, with uh, people with, in slaughterhouses, 
Then, uh, as many people uh, learned from United States and other countries, the so COVID-19 outbreak occurs in slaughterhouse workers. Then, now uh, their decision is whether to shut down the meat factory uh, slaughterhouse or not. Then it affects to uh, the consumption pattern of people. Then uh, slaughterhouses, we in Japan, in the case of Japan, we realized that's the uh, structure of the buildings uh, are not well prepared for such pandemic. So it was very difficult for them to prevent COVID-19 in their work uh, roads, work people. Uh, yeah, so um, my comment is uh, the COVID-19 caused uh, different aspects of effects on the food system. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Makita. Okay, now we we'll move to the next question, uh, probably applicable to all the speakers this morning. Whether the, the participants, one of the participants, ask whether uh, our world uh, is better prepared against emerging diseases in place. I mean, in practice against that the uh, new uh, emerging pathogen comes. Do you think uh, we, we, are we are prepared enoughly or we need more uh, preparedness for this next emerging disease? Anyone? Probably pro uh, Dr. Song, you, you can. Yeah, I think technically it. and also global agreement, uh, it's quite, I mean, uh, as I uh, mentioned that uh, Many countries like UK and America, uh, USA and uh, CEPI and Wellcome Trust and also Korea also considers the 100 days of vaccine uh, development. And based on that, you know, uh, strategies, I think uh, they wanted to use all the possible tools and uh, uh, ways to uh, achieve that goals. I think uh, this uh, Corona, I think uh, we are experiencing really on predecessant pre and uh, on uh, we, we don't have any experience. So, and then I think uh, also uh, many institutes and uh, government organizations, they are uh, preparing uh, many different ways to uh, prepare better and next pandemic. I think uh, I cannot say the details, but uh, many things is ongoing. And participation also in the global you know, effort to you know, work together, something like that. So already uh, many things are ongoing. So, I think in next time, uh, I think uh, uh, in vaccine development, uh, for vaccine development, I think uh, much faster and uh, much more uh, mass production will be done. Uh, uh, so we can have a better uh, systems or uh, mechanism to uh, dealing with this uh, pandemic. I'm pretty sure about that. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I'd like to ask you, the Professor Wu, what did you learn from the past experience uh, the MERS and SARS outbreak versus that the current COVID-19 is more pandemic. The how can we prepare related to the, uh, this participant's question in the future? As uh, the, the Dr. Song said, vaccination, development, vaccine and vaccination is quite critical in the future. However, uh, you may have some uh, the medical uh, treatment or medical preparedness comparing more SARS experience versus pandemic diseases such as COVID-19? Yes, um, compared with the SARS epidemic in 2003, um, of course, we, 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 we can um, do it in, in terms of diagnosis, treatment, and vaccine. Like for vaccine development, obviously we have improved a lot because when we have COVID-19, we have the mRNA vac vaccine platform already there. And it is so well applied to COVID-19 that everybody is using uh, mRNA vaccine for COVID-19. And that has reduced mortality a lot, more than 10 times. And that is very, very successful. And um, before this particular epidemic of COVID-19, mRNA vaccine was ha, has never been used uh, like that in infectious diseases. So this time it shows that it, 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 
a new vaccine platform can be so useful in for an emerging infectious disease. So that is the very encouraging part. And uh, like um, uh, what uh, other speakers have mentioned, like the CEPI is um, testing many different vaccine platforms for different infectious diseases. And I'm sure if another emerging for another infectious disease emerge, people can test immediately. Uh, uh, the various vaccine platforms on on the new new emerging pathogen, and that will probably uh, lead to a rapid response in terms of vaccine development, like within a hundred days, so as to reduce mortality a lot. I'm sure if COVID nineteen happens like twenty years ago, thirty years ago, the mortality would be much higher than what we have now. So in terms of like um, uh, antiviral development, uh, there, there, there's also some development because when we have the SARS epidemic in 2003, there was no um, anti-coronavirus agents at all. This time, initially, we also didn't have any anti-coronavirus agent, but uh, like half a year ago, we started to have at least two anti-coronavirus agents, one from MSD, one from Pfizer, which are pretty much um, uh, good for the um, SARS coronavirus too. Of course, we also have other um, developments like monoclonal development because we can develop um, a monoclonal antibody against the uh, coronavirus, and that also is helpful. So um, in terms of um, antiviral development, yes, we do have some, some progress. But one, 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 one thing that we have been facing in the last 20 years was that when SARS epidemic first occurred, there was a lot of funding in coronavirus research. But then, you know, SARS, SARS disappeared within a few months, within one year. And then all the funding suddenly stopped because people thought that, oh, it's gone. People then moved back to influenza and then Zika and then Ebola and, and, and other infectious diseases. So the funding in coronavirus stopped. And, this time, it shows very clearly that um, these like emerging coronaviruses may not um, emerge only once. It may come back. It may come back in another form. Another new coronavirus may emerge. So we really should be uh, very serious about the development of anti-coronavirus agents because in coronavirus, coronavirus is actually a, contains a pretty big genome. 30 kilo, 30 kilo bases is actually the, the largest RNA virus genome. So there are many potential gene targets that we can we can we can develop antiviral against, like the RNA dependent RNA polymerase. There are different proteases, and so on and so forth. So so that is antiviral development. For 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 another thing is the laboratory side, rapid diagnosis. Rapid diagnosis is is, is pretty good because uh, people now can develop the uh, real time RT PCR assay very quickly, and also the rapid test in terms of antigen detection, electron flow. I'm sure this is already very very good already. So so I think that's that's uh, what I would like to comment. Thank can you. I can I add one Please. thing? Yes. Yeah. I think uh, this uh, Corona uh, changed everything. I, uh, before this Corona, you remember there is a Zika pandemic. At the time, the from the uh, early development to per page one clinic trial, it uh, takes six months. But when this Corona started, the vaccine development from the early development to uh, page one clinic trial, it takes only two months. I think. Uh, uh, it was just five or five years ago, but uh, from this uh, Corona, I think in vaccine development, there are uh, it's game changer. Uh, as you remember, the Anthony Pouch said early uh, uh, in the pandemic early season, he said it takes at least eighteen months. But finally, it just takes like less than uh, around ten months. I think uh, uh, so. 
So now I think uh, we knew how to we can make vaccine as early as possible, and, as, and we do all possible ways to develop vaccine very quickly. So I think uh, this time it is completely different from the past, like uh, SARS or MERS or Zika. So uh, we, we do whatever you can in this time. So I think uh, this experience uh, will uh, do, uh, really change uh, for the next pandemic. I think it's much better you can do. Yeah. That's my uh, comment. Thank you, Dr. Mm. So. Mm. Yeah, I agree with the Professor Wu and Dr. So's comment on this. Uh, yes, based on our previous experience in most of us, uh, quite a few uh, platform has been implemented to fight against the new emerging pathogen uh, through the vaccination or development of effective preparedness. And also, as Professor Wu said, the continuous funding is very critical to encourage researchers, scientists, to prepare against the, the invading pathogens. So I really uh, respect your work. 2005, 2006, you have already found the coronavirus in all different kinds of animals with different phylogenetic trees. That is a critical clue in the future how that uh, the, all the scientists in, in the world can prepare uh, better uh, to uh, better against that, uh, that uh, emerging pathogen we call the disease X. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, before we wrap up, I would like to invite the, the former president of ASA. He has one question and he has a final closing uh, uh, speech. Please welcome the, the Professor Kim Yu Hang uh, for his one quick question and the final uh, closing uh, speech. I have a very small question to Professor Makida. Uh, in Korea, we have uh, cases of uh, rabies coming down from North Korea to South Korea through the wild animals living in the demilitarized zones. Right? And we are thinking of placing bait back vaccines in the DMZ. <laughs> it's a typical problem in Korea. And I'm quite, uh, I have some doubt about the efficacy of the bait vaccines because the bait vaccine will decay in, in a few days. And also, it's subjected to the vagrancies of nature. So. Maybe rain, it rains, maybe it's, uh, they have so, so, so much factors affecting its efficacy. How long can it, can it maintain its efficacy? Oh, uh, thank you very much for the very uh, important uh, question to answer. Uh, to uh, consider about the efficacy of vaccines uh, in wildlife uh, is very, very hard task. Uh, because uh, it is not only about the reaction uh, of individual animals, but also we need to uh, think about population dynamics uh, and the behavior uh, of uh, animals. Uh, in, in, in addition to the, the decay of the vaccine itself. So uh, I was uh, my my answer is um, I don't have a, uh, a clear answer, but uh, we are we need to prepare uh, the epidemiological techniques uh, to uh, appropriately address the answer uh, before uh, implementation or during the implementation. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you very thank much. You. Thank you. Yeah, I can add uh, that our previous experience as a veterinarian and European uh, Union have developed the beta vaccine against the rabies virus uh, using recombinant protein vaccine using the chicken head. It was very effective and that uh, uh, the immunity maintained more than six months. So in, in special cases for like uh, North and South Korea, we cannot uh, communicate well, then we can think about the kind of possibility we have experienced in, in European unions. 
Okay, thank you again for your all, for the all speakers this morning. And finally, I would like to invite to the, the as I said, uh, the, the former president of ASA uh, to, to have a final uh, the closing. Okay. Speech. First of all, in be in behalf of the ASA community, I would like to thank all the speakers for their excellent talk to the yesterday and today. And also, I'd like to express my gratitude to the Korean Academy of Science for hosting this workshop and the organizers and the staff of CAST for their time and effort to make this workshop a success. The ASA workshop functions as a forum in which we meet together and share our knowledge, experience, and expertise and come up with the adaptive and uh, uh, mitigative measures to the problems we face, and possibly, if it's possible, then some solutions to the, to problem, the problems. Problem. The lessons we learned at this workshop must not stay among ourselves only. only. It must be propagated to as widely as possible. And, uh, and also the valuable lessons we have learned must be crystallized into a resolution or recommendations to the policymakers as well as general public. The ASA Secretariat will do its best to disseminate the results of this workshop and also the resolution, resolution or recommendations you come up with to all stakeholders in the Asia and the Pacific area via ASA's member academies and also via the Inter-Academic Partnerships Network. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Professor Kim. Before we wrap up for two days conference in CAST and ASA International Webinar, uh, as a chair, I would like to conclude that uh, uh, for the future, we need to uh, develop that better collaboration uh, internationally, uh, including the international organization like World Health Organization, World, World Organization for Animal Health, and the Food and Agriculture Organization, and uh, World Bank for funding, and the UK Trust Bank for funding, and some other uh, private sectors for funding. This kind of collaboration for one health development in the future, as well as for the next generation for better life. Thank you very much for joining us. And thank you. Have a good day.